10 caterpillars are a group of caterpillars that um, occur across North America. There are five different species of them, and they all have population cycles. That means that every 10 years or so, they're really high numbers and people get annoyed with them and then they disappear. That's what's so fascinating about 10 caterpillars. What are 10 caterpillars? They're cute little hairy things that live in groups. Something I was introduced to by Judy Myers in the late 1980s. And they're just fascinating. I'm Judy Myers. I'm an insect population ecologist and I've studied tent caterpillars for 46 years. My name is Jenny Corey. I work at Simon Fraser University and I'm a disease ecologist. I particularly study the diseases of insects. When I was doing my graduate degree, I chose to study small mammals and have three-year population cycles. And then during that period of time, I gave a seminar on tent caterpillars with their 10-year population cycles and they have interesting behavior. They uh, do things as a group. They go out feeding together every morning and evening and they have these population cycles. So when I came to British Columbia, the home of the western tent caterpillar, I thought that would be a good species to study. Tent caterpillars uh, get their name from the fact that they live in silken tents. The the question is, what are those tents for? And that varies from species to species. For the western tent caterpillar that we've looked at the most, they use it for a platform for basking in the sun to warm up in our cold springs that we have on the west coast of North America. Because they're hairy, not many predators like tent caterpillars. I've seen um, wasps, yellow jackets go for them, but on the whole, they're pretty difficult to handle and they are protected by their tents. You have to look at them up close to see how pretty they are. They have yellow and black and white spots on them. They are very, what we call polyphagous. They like many different host plants. They particularly like trees, fruit trees. And when they're really desperate, they'll eat other sort of plants, but they've got a pretty wide host range. Tent caterpillars overwinter as eggs in the egg mass. They, shortly after the egg mass is laid, they develop into the larva and then they sit there in an innate state. They have to have a period of cold before they will hatch the next spring. The little caterpillars begin producing silk as soon as they come out of the egg mass. They begin forming these tents. They go through five and sometimes six instars or developmental stages before they form a cocoon, pupate, and then hatch as moths. My interest really started because they're actually a, an organism that where disease plays a major role. I met Judy Myers and she was working on tent caterpillars and I thought this is a great system to study disease. They have population cycles which are cool so they go up, they go down and they go down because they get a, a pathogen, a virus and that was my speciality. So my first interest was academic so I wanted to see a system in the wild where pathogens really played a role but then when you start studying them, you realize how fascinating they are. The more you study them, the more you find the interesting things that, that they do, such as the diseases that we've spent a lot of time looking at the virus. Do they become resistant to the virus? No, they don't seem to. How does the food plant affect their infection? Well, it can have a factor. They are more readily infected if they're feeding on alders than if they're feeding on rose bushes. Things of that sort that have to do with their behavior. I studied ten caterpillars on Saturna because I had a graduate student who was starting, he wanted to do this project again on disease and the caterpillars and the densities were quite low in many of the areas but he heard through the grapevine that on Saturna there was a population that was quite high and so he first came out and collected caterpillars from here. And that was in the 1980s. And so we have followed populations out here ever since. And then I bought a property on Saturna and that made it more convenient to study them here. And it's a beautiful location. One of the really 
interesting things about ten caterpillars is these big tents that they produce. So whereas many other species that are individual, it's very hard to get counts of their numbers. With these tents, we can walk along a road and get out our binoculars and search the trees and count how many families are developing in that area in that particular summer. Measure a tent by lo locating an easily accessible tent and we measure its sort of width and length just using a ruler. So it's a very simple technique, but it means we can measure a lot of tents in a short time. The size of the tent is an indicator of how many larvae make it through to the late instars. So it's a sort of a surrogate for survival. And particularly if we have the number of larvae that began by finding the egg mass and counting how many little larvae hatched, and then we have the size of the tent at the end, we can use that as an estimate of the survival of that group. And we find that that varies over the population cycle, that when the populations are expanding, the tents are large. When they're at high density, the tents tend to be smaller. Uh, the larvae probably aren't as active and therefore not as able to form big tents. The best thing about studying tent caterpillars is that we're really learning something about a natural system where a pathogen and a host are interacting over space and over time. So it actually tells us how a disease can affect a host and how a host maybe affects the evolution of that pathogen. So I think we can learn a lot about host pathogen interactions and dynamics. We go to areas one year and there, there's nothing there. And then we go back the next year and there are 16 tents that we find or a hundred tents or, and then they just take off from there. So that, that to me is fascinating. The populations crash as the virus peaks and we have quite strong evidence that it drives the population cycles. So you're really bound by their natural dynamics. So they come and they go in cycles. So they're here one year, they might be here for a couple of years and then they crash and you might not see them again for six or seven years. So it makes it a really hard research topic. But the good thing about them is that whatever we see is what's really going on in the field.